Well, good evening. As James said, we're excited that you're at our first presidential uh, speaker series events of the school year. Uh, my name is Lon Moeller. I'm the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost. Again, I want to welcome you to uh, this very special event. Uh, we've changed the program a little bit. Uh, James mentioned this. Our focus will be on aviation and aerospace industry leaders, prominent alumni, and important trailblazers in these and related fields who address our students, our faculty, our staff, and our community members. Uh, our programs in the Presidential Speaker Series will now start at 630. Of course, they're open to the public and free of charge. Uh, tonight's presidential speaker is Mr. Barry Eccleston, retired CEO and president of Airbus America. Uh, Mr. Eccleston will be speaking about 50 years of aerospace past and future, uh, though he's very excited in answering the questions that you may have uh, after the fireside chat with our moderator. I would like to first thank our uh, host for tonight's presidential speaker event, uh, President Barry Butler and Dr. Audrey Butler, so thank you very much for that. Uh, one change for the speaker series is the moderator. You might recognize uh, this is not Mark Bernier. He's a little bit younger than Mark, uh, who did that job in the past. Uh, but we've decided to use uh, the students that we have on campus to be moderators. We had some success with this last year, and I think it's a really good opportunity for Riddle students, and they're always uh, ready for the challenge. And so our speaker tonight is, our moderator tonight is Jim Myers. Uh, Jim is a sophomore from Johnsburg, Illinois, majoring in Aviation Business Administration. Jim is a College of Business representative with the Student Government Association, a Campus Safety and Security Department student dispatcher, an orientation team member, and a student assistant in the Career Services Office. You must not sleep, Jim. And he's only a sophomore, which I think we all find rather incredible. Uh, this summer, Jim was an intern with the Experimental Aircraft Association, working in their Government Affairs Office in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The EAA also happens to host the world's largest air show every summer. I'm sure many of you have attended EAA. Uh, over 10,000 aircraft uh, fly during the week-long event, and over 640,000 people attended the events this past July. So without further ado, I'll turn the uh, speaker over to, uh, to Jim Myers. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, the focus tonight, Mr. Eccleston, um, please introduce yourself. Surely. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Jim, for volunteering to do this tonight. Very brave. Um, <laughs> President and Dr. Butler, thank you very much for inviting me and for hosting us, faculty that we've met today. Um, it's actually, let me just preface by saying this is my first visit to Embry-Riddle, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to say. Um, I've been in the industry for 50 years, and I'd heard so much about uh, Embry-Riddle, but never actually been here. Uh, so when I was invited to come down, I thought this is a great opportunity to, uh, to learn something about the college. And I have been blown away. I have been up all day long, since 8 o'clock this morning we've been touring, and I've been blown away by everything I've seen. Um, not just the university and the campus, uh, but the amazing facilities, the terrific research and innovation that's going on. Uh, and most of all, uh, the energy that I'm sensing about the place, which is coming from you, uh, the students here, the student body. Uh, and I think your new student union is amazing. I wish I'd had one of them when I was at college 50 years ago. So with that little introduction, over to your question, Jim. Um, so I, I just admitted that I'm uh, one of the older generation of our industry. I graduated in 1969 uh, at a university called Loughborough um, in the middle of England. Uh, I was born in England, grew up in England, and when I decided to go to college, I decided I wanted to be in uh, aeronautics. Um, and I signed up for aeronautical engineering at Loughborough. It was a small university. In fact, it wasn't even a university when I started. It was a college. It became a university while I was there. Um, we had 2,000 students. Uh, on the day I arrived, 100% of those 2,000 students were guys. Um, when I left, we were about 5% female. Uh, our diversity statistics were not that great back in those days. Um, and so one of the things was uh, I, I got involved with a student union. Um, used to organize some dances and that was the challenge because we had to find some ladies and so we would literally literally and I hate to say this but we would bus in um, the students from the local teachers training college to provide some female company for the Saturday night dances uh, and then part of my job was to make sure that all those young ladies got back on the bus and went home at the end of the evening which was more challenging um, <laughs> We had some fun though, uh, because um, this was in the UK in the 1960s, and so we used to book bands for our local dances, and, and, uh, and I'd say to the promoter, so who you got for me this month? 
And he'd say, well, I've got this, this guy, he's, he's a bit rough around the edges, he's pretty cheap, he, we, can pro we can probably afford him like 500 pounds. And I say, fine, who is he? And his, his name is Joe Cocker. Okay, fine, we'll have Joe Cocker. Um, and another time we had the Pink Floyd, and another time we had Procol Harum. It, it was a fabulous time. Anyway, I'm, I digress, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> university was terrific. Uh, by some miracle, I graduated exactly 50 years ago in July. And boy, what, a, what an amazing time that was if you wanted to be in the aviation business. 1969 was the first flight of the Boeing 747, uh, the first flight of the Concorde aeroplane, obviously Apollo 11, which took place uh, the same week uh, that I graduated. Um, and other things, Airbus was formed in 1969. So there was no lack of inspiration inspirational projects and programs and inspirational people uh, when I came into the business 50 years ago, which is where we teed off with the theme tonight, which is the 50 years that I spent in the business um, versus what's going to happen in the next 50 years. Um, when I graduated, I joined Rolls-Royce. Uh, in the UK at the time, Rolls-Royce was the premier engineering business in the country. Uh, it was every engineering graduate's dream to be offered a, a space at Rolls-Royce, and I was lucky enough through the contacts at the university, it was very local, um, to get into Rolls-Royce on their graduate apprenticeship. This involved spending six weeks in various departments of Rolls-Royce uh, for 18 months, uh, during which time uh, you're supposed to convince one of these departments that you, they really need to employ you full time. So was it like a rotational program? Yes, it was like a rotational program, exactly. So I started off in um, performance engineering, and, and then I went to market forecasting, and, and then I went to uh, sales, and, uh, and I finished up at one point in the flight test department. Well, this was cool, because you got to work with real aeroplanes, doing flight tests yeah. in aeroplanes. Uh, I, I, had, I had originally wanted to be a fast jet pilot in the Royal Air Force, but my eyesight was not good enough, so I couldn't get in. Um, so what I did do in, in Rolls-Royce was I finished up my full-time job was um, running the flight test program on the new, at that time, uh, the new British F4 Phantom aeroplane with the Rolls-Royce Spay engine. So I got to fly back seat doing all the flight tests in, in an F4. Uh, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. This was pretty cool. Um, the, the biggest challenge was uh, back in those days, you may have seen pictures, uh, everybody had really long, thick, bushy hair. <laughs> yes, even including me, I had long, thick, bushy hair, and getting the bone done on was a bit of a challenge. Anyway, um, great job, loved it. Uh, and then I met a, a lady who pretty quickly became my wife, still is. Uh, we had kids, and I thought I'd better grow up and get a real job. Um, and I moved out of the flight test department, flight test engineering department, to uh, sales engineering, which was an interesting transition because it began to move, it was still engineering, but it was moving a little bit more into the business side of the business. So when you got to go through each of those different departments, you got a taste of what each of them do. Yes, exactly. And, and more importantly, um, what the engine would do for the customer, which is why we build these things. Right. Um, so I moved into sales engineering, began to work with customers, mostly on military programs, um, the, the Harrier vertical takeoff jet to start with. Um, and I, I seem to be reasonably good at this selling thing, uh, at least working with customers. Uh, and so I actually, um, I got then posted, Rolls-Royce posted me and the family to Japan. We went to Tokyo for four years um, and looked after the Rolls-Royce sales activity in Japan, South Korea and Taiwan back in the 70s. Very exciting time to be there. Learned a lot about the broad range of Rolls-Royce activities. Um, came back from Japan to Rolls-Royce Derby, got involved with the commercial airplane business, engines for airplanes like the L-1011 and the Boeing 757, uh, which really exposed me to the airline business, and I found that I loved it. I, I love working with the airlines as my customer. Got very interested in the airline customer base. Um, in 1983, uh, Rolls-Royce said, well, we're forming a joint venture program with Pratt & Whitney otherwise our arch competitor, but now apparently we're going to work with them together. And we're going to do this joint venture program called International Aero Engines, and, and the engine was called the V2500, and it was supposed to go on to the Airbus A320, newly launched at that time. 
Uh, and not only was it Rolls Royce and, and uh, Pratt and Whitney, but we had three different Japanese companies. We had MTU from Germany, and we had Fiat from Italy. So it was a it was a collaboration that we were forming with five different nationalities and eight different companies involved to develop this brand new engine. Um, it's a pretty tall challenge. Yeah. Um, particularly with the, the two leaders who had equal shares uh, had spent the last 50 years banging up against each other. Nonetheless, uh, Rolls-Royce said, Barry, proceed to Hartford, Connecticut, um, set up this joint venture company with Pratt & Whitney, um, and once it's working, you can come home again. And the HR director whispered in my said, Barry, let me tell you, this is going to fail. You'll be back in six months. Don't sell your house in England, right? Uh, and I, I learned very quickly that I love it when people say, it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Guys, if anybody says to you, it can't be done, that's your challenge to show them otherwise. It's amazing what you can do when people think you can't. Um, so we took the challenge, and uh, here we are 30, 30 plus years later, 35 years later, uh, 8,000 engines have been built, it's still being built. It's the third most successful engine program ever, um, and those of us who are involved on the ground floor are very proud of that. We learned a lot about the art of collaboration, managing collaborations. Um, I returned to Rolls-Royce fully in 1989, but it was still in North America, running the North American Airline Sales Organization, selling engines to, to US airlines. Uh, it was a good time to be doing that. The market was expanding. Um, we had some good products, and so we were able to grow the business quite well. Uh, and based on that success, Rolls-Royce had an, a brilliant idea of sending me to Canada to run all the businesses in Canada. Uh, go to Toronto. We had six different factories in four different activities, airplanes, engines, power transformers, power generators. It was a collection of businesses that had been acquired over the years, mm -hmm. and they put it into one company uh, called Rolls-Royce Canada. Uh, and they sent me up there to run it. Um, it was about a billion dollars a year business, um, about a thousand employees. Mr. Eccleston, at that time, what, what age were you? Uh, let me think, that must have been 1993, early 40s, I'm thinking, yeah, early 40s. Um, 40, 45. Um, and to be honest, Jim, I was totally ill-equipped to do that. Um, Rolls had sent me on a management training course in Switzerland for a month. Uh, it was fascinating. I learned a lot, but it was very high-level stuff. Just got thrown right in. It was nothing like, here's how you have to run a factory of, of union employees. Yeah, that's a hard job to teach. Yeah. Um, and and that, was, that was probably... Um, one of my two, uh, I'll call it, trials of fire, uh, that where I've disappointed myself uh, professionally in this case, because I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't learn quickly enough how to make the tough decisions you have to make if you're running a factory as opposed to selling a product to a customer, keeping a customer satisfied. Very interesting learning experience for me, which I flunked to start with. Um, Fortunately, after a couple of years, fortunately for me and for the company, uh, Rolls-Royce said, well, actually, we've got a, a better job for you. We want you to go back to Connecticut and run International Aero Engines, be the president of the whole company and oh. run the program, um, which, having been there at the birth of, of the baby, I was now very pleased to go back and sort of be a, a parent of an adolescent, if you like. Absolutely. Um, so we moved back to Connecticut, did that for four years. Again, it was a great time to be doing it. We sold a lot of engines, a lot of engines, and a lot of success. In 1998, Rolls-Royce was looking for someone to manage their total North American business. Um, and I was put forward as the internal candidate. We had an external candidate. Um, a, guy, a guy who was a friend of mine from an airline business. Um, and he got the job, and I didn't. Uh, it was a bit of a disappointment, but I wasn't surprised. But in, in, the, in the classical way of American business, I said, OK, this is my sign that it's time to ship out. Yeah. Um, so I left Rolls-Royce, uh, and I joined the regional jet business, at the time a company called Fairchild Dornier. Fairchild Dornier were a US-German corporation, two different companies that had come together. I had an office in San Antonio and an office in Oberpfaffenhofen in Germany. Um, and I'd shuttle between the two. Um, we were developing a new series of uh, uh, 30, 50, and 70-seat regional jets. 
Um, and it was going really well because the products, the airplanes were great products, uh, German engineering, really good quality, although not cheap, um, and the market was very receptive. But unfortunately, 9-11 came along. And when 9-11 happened, uh, airlines stopped buying. This meant we did not get the deposits on the orders. We had, did not, we, our cash income was starved. And we ran out of cash, and when you run out of cash, you go bankrupt. In the US, you have the lifeline of Chapter 11. Yeah. In Europe, you don't. Um, company went out of business. Uh, and that was my second tribulation, if you like, in my career. And this was more of a personal one. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a lot of the guys that were working for me, I had brought them. They came because I was there. They came with me. Mm -hmm. uh, they were out of a job. I had to tell them they were out of a job. Go and find yourself a job somewhere else. Uh, and I spent a lot of time trying to help them do that. Um, I was also out of a job um, for six months. And the headhunters all said, Barry, at your level, uh, it will take six months before you're even going to get an approach. It's not going to happen overnight. Be patient. Uh, I was not very good at being patient. My wife said during that six months I was at home, I was unlivable with. And l looking back on it, I can, I can well imagine what she must have been going through at the time. I was, I was very, you know, hyper. Um, fortunately, didn't take to drink. Anyway, uh, so after six months, in fact, it was six months to the day, uh, I joined Honeywell. Um, Honeywell wanted someone to look after their aerospace business in Europe, Middle East and Africa, based in Paris. And I said, yep, I can do that. Um, so moved to Paris uh, on a five-year assignment uh, to sort of grow the Honeywell aerospace business in Europe. Uh, after one year, my boss at Honeywell, Bob Johnson, came along um, and Bob says, uh, Barry, you, you know about engines, right? And I said, yeah, I used to work in the business for almost 30 years. And he said, good, we need someone to run our engines business in Phoenix. Proceed to Phoenix and take over the engines business. And it literally was that conversation. Uh, I, 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 my wife and I were actually on vacation in Bergen, Norway. We were just sitting down to have our dinner. I remember it well. Mussels and chips and a pint of local beer. And the phone rings and it's Bob. And I have this conversation. It's unreal. And, Bob, and I say, Bob, we're you know, just, just beginning to make progress in Europe. I don't want to go to Phoenix. And he said, Barry, let me explain this to you. <laughs> so Bob explained that there was no option. And a month later, um, Valerie and I showed up in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. Um, I did have to stop in the chairman's office along the way and be interviewed by him, but that seemed to go okay. Um, so we went to work in Phoenix. Uh, Honeywell's engines business at the time, some of you may not know this, uh, was 65,000 engines in service. Uh, if you're in the turboprop business or in the regional, the, the small corporate jet business, mm -hmm. it was Honeywell or it was Pratt Whitney. And Honeywell had a huge, huge market presence. Um, it was about a one and a half billion to two billion dollar a year business, um, and I was totally responsible for the P&L and the whole business, new engine development, everything. It was kind of like having not my own business. I didn't view it that way. It was the company's business, but I was the one who was supposed to make it happen. And I learned a lot, and I did not revisit my mistakes in Canada. I would reflected on that. Mm -hmm. I would learned that I needed to take some tough decisions once I understood the business, was prepared to make them, um, showed the sort of leadership, but more importantly, learned a lot about US company management process, mm -hmm. and especially program management. Learned a lot about program management. Very, very valuable skill. Brings everything together. Absolutely. Um, so Honeywell went really well for me. The business went well. And, and then one day we had a change of management at Honeywell, uh, and the next day it wasn't the same place. This happens in industry, you have to be ready for it. Um, but just about that same time, I had a phone call from an old friend of mine at Airbus, who, who I, had, I had been a supplier to Airbus for many years, mm -hmm. um, in Rolls-Royce, in IE, and in Honeywell. So I knew Airbus very well, and they said, uh, we want someone to look after the North American business uh, based in, in Washington. Um, can you come and do that? And I said, yep, when do I start? And John said, start next week. In fact, he said, start next week in Hawaii. It's our annual customer conference in Hawaii. So bring your wife to Hawaii for a week, and that'll be your introduction. That sounds good. And I said, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, signed up for five years. Uh, that was in 2005. 
and I, I left 12 and a half years later when I retired, and that was, that was last year. And I loved every minute of working for Airbus. Fabulous job, fabulous company. I used to tell everybody, I got the best job in aerospace, because I, I get to look after Air, Airbus's business in the North American airline marketplace, and I do that 4,000 miles away from my boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Long story, Jim, but that's, that's the story. Well, it sounds like you've done just about everything. Um, so, Mr. Arkelson, when, you're, when you move to each of those new companies and new positions with different responsibilities, how did you adapt to each new position? It, it's, it's a really good question. Um, there's many different approaches. My own approach um, is, uh, I, I like to think I'm a people person. So the first thing I do is meet the people and listen to the people yeah. and learn from the people. Learn from the people who have been there a long while. You know not all of them is going to be right. You know some of them is going to have their own personal bias. Of course. Uh, even some of their own personal feuds to settle. Mm -hmm. You have to take that into account. But generally, generally, if, if you're in the aerospace business, generally it's good people. That's why I do it. Um, the, the people we let into our club are going to be respectable club members if they're in our industry. So uh, you can generally assume that the people you're going to meet are good people and listen to them and learn from them. And so for the first 100 days, that's what I would do. And after doing that for 100 days, you should have a pretty damn good idea of who this company is, what their business is, most important of all, who their customers are, because the people you go and listen to are also the customers. Absolutely. Um, and what needs to be done. And then, then you start making mid-course corrections, if you like. Uh, and the way I would do that, my, my own personal approach, which is kind of an approach to management or leadership generally, is um, trust the people, establish great teams. N n we may be the greatest single mind in, in, the, in the room, but you're nothing without the team to support you. So listen to everybody, take the team's input. Once, the, once you've got all the team's input, collectively, if you can, make a decision. If you can't, you, the leader, have to make the decision. And once you've made that decision, everyone has to work together to get the result, to rowing towards that result. You can't have any dissension. You can't have, oh, well, we just made a decision, now we'll go and discuss it. Once the decision's made, the leader's biggest job is to make sure everybody's rowing in that same direction and get the result. Absolutely. So what was your, with all those companies, what was your favorite position? Favorite position? It depend, depends on the viewpoint of the career at the time. Um, my all-time favorite position was flying backseat in the F4 at Mark II up and down the English Channel, shutting down the engines. <laughs> um, not something you get to do every day. Not at all. Uh, and and being, being sort of a, an amateur pilot and, and someone who has kerosene in the blood, that was, that was great. Um, my, my most, uh, I'll call it favorite, almost treasured um, achievement for the business was setting up international aero engines and making it happen when nobody else believed it could be done. And it wasn't just me, it was all the other people who thought like me, the people we collected together yeah. who said, we're going to show everybody it, can't be, it can be done. Uh, and, and we did. Uh, within the first couple of days, we'd, we'd have a little cardboard box on the conference table. And the guys from Pratt and Japan and ourselves, and we'd all meet. And any time that anyone around the table said, we, and they meant their old company, mm -hmm. put a dollar in that box. They call it the wee box. Um, and by the end of the year, we had enough money to fund the Christmas party. But people, <laughs> people quickly realized we, we was now international aero engines. Yes. We're collectively bound together in this cause. So my, my favorite achievement from the business point of view was um, being part of the team that created and launched the V2500 engine, which has become one of the staples of our industry. My favorite personal achievement, um, again, another it can't be done story. Um, I, I joined Airbus in 2005. At that time, Airbus had not sold an aeroplane to American Airlines since 1992. Um, indeed, American Airlines actually had an exclusive agreement with uh, Boeing that they would only buy Boeing aeroplanes. And on July the 21st, 2011, um, 
American announced a, a deal with Airbus for 260 aeroplanes, which I personally negotiated. Um, and I don't say this to blow my own horn, but the point is, when people say it can't be done, take that as your personal challenge. I, I knew the people at American, uh, Gerard R.P., Tom Horton, all those guys, longtime friends of mine. Um, and through that, we were able to sort of develop a rapport, um, re regenerate the trust with American. Because remember, um, an A300 had crashed and killed several hundred people in 2001, right. in October 2001. And there was very bad blood after that between Airbus and American. But we were able to repair that. We were able to get the product lodged, it was a terrific product, the Airbus A320neo, and do this major deal. And personally, with the role that I played in that, that's probably my single, for me, my single greatest achievement or best memory. So Mr. Eccleston, you mentioned about being a pilot yourself. How did that um, benefit you being in the business aviation? Um, so. I, I, I've always been interested in aeroplanes, but what I found is, we talked earlier on about the indus, aviation industry being kind of like a big club, uh, and people come into the business because they like aeroplanes, we call it kerosene in the blood, and that's me. Um, and so you meet an awful lot of people in our industry who are there because of the passion and the love of aviation and what it has done for the world, making the world a smaller place, bringing people together. That's something I noticed coming right at right to Embry Riddle is our caliber of students are it's just such a high caliber because everyone there is for a passion to exactly participate in the aviation industry exactly um, and I found an awful lot of those pilots people were pilots love to fly aeroplanes you know they they got into the business because they love to fly aeroplanes as well as love the business it's part of the business um, so I, I, I felt the same, but I didn't have the opportunity to be professionally trained as a pilot. So as soon as I could, I went out and became a private pilot. Uh, just, I'm afraid to say VFR, although I got my instrument rating about a month ago, now, I, now I'm retired. Um, uh, yes, uh, guys, if you, think, if you think going to university is tough, try getting an instrument rating at the age of 71 years old. And, and all the, <laughs> I was too old to go through all this stuff. Um, anyway, so yeah, being a pilot gives you a, a much better understanding of the customer's needs, a much better understanding of the total aviation ecosystem, and a very close camaraderie with a lot of the industry leaders who are also pilots. I, I would say at least 50% of my friends who are CEOs of companies like airlines and OEMs fly themselves. And I'm, I'm sure a higher respect from employees that work for you. Um, it's, yes, you, you're probably right. Um, didn't do it because of that, but you're right. I, th I, think, I think the employees do say, well, this guy is a, a total aviation. One person. of us. Yeah, exactly, one of us, exactly, yeah. So tell me a time when you thought everything was going well and it just fell flat. Mm. What did you do? Um, so that's going to happen many times, pretty much every week. Um, <laughs> sometimes more dramatic than others. Uh, yeah. This week, my disappointment was I got in my little Cessna to fly down here yesterday morning and the alternator crapped out. And I was really disappointed because we weren't going anywhere. Um, when I thought about it, I realized actually much better that the alternator craps out when I'm sitting on the ramp at my home airport than when I'm halfway down Victor Absolutely, 1 somewhere off the ideal. coast of Georgia, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, there, there's disappointments of some kind every week. Um, the two biggest in my life we already talked about um, when I let myself down, more importantly the company down, when I didn't do a good job in Canada, and, and then the bankruptcy. Now, what do you do about it? Um, in the case of Canada, uh, the company and I sort of recognized this wasn't working as well as it should, and the company were kind enough to give me a second chance and move me to IE, which was more in my swim lane, yeah. and did a much better job there. But I was able then to reflect on everything I'd learned in Canada and process that for the next time the opportunity occurred, which was then at, at, at Honeywell. Um, and I, and I, so I, I use that as a big learning experience. Um, but I was fortunate the company gave me a second chance. Not every company will do that. Absolutely. It, se it seems like that, that self-disappointment in yourself really kept you, really encouraged you to do better and carry yourself up. Uh, exactly. And then the, the issue of the bankruptcy of Fairchild Dornia, uh, as I said, I felt very responsible for the lives of a lot of people who had come to work for us. And that taught me to be, 
I like to think more empathetic towards people issues. Yes. Uh, kind of before that, I was becoming a bit of a bit of a machine. Um, there's never enough time in the day to do everything. So as a leader, you will find that you're going to have to ration your time management. And what this means is you don't have time enough to listen to everybody's concerns about, you know, the dog threw up on the breakfast table. Um, and I was not very empathetic. My wife, to my wife kept telling me, but I didn't believe her, you're not very empathetic, uh, even to my kids. Um, I, learned, I learned how tough it can be for employees. Uh, and I, I, I had a lot of personal learning came out of that. But the other message, I would say, and this will happen to some of you, I hope not many of you, but it will happen to some of you, where you will have these really down, down moments. Um, and that was, that was my down moment. But you have to use that as an opportunity. You have to, you have to be patient and realize that um, you will come through that. And another opportunity will come along. It may not be as quick as you want or you think, but another opportunity will come along because people will believe in you. And when it does, you seize that other opportunity and you show people what you really can do. Um, and, and if I may, another little personal note, it's relevant. Um, I was doing something like this at, at, a, at a university in Newport News, Virginia, called Christopher Newport University. And we were speaking to the business school there. Um, we had an audience very similar to this, more business oriented. And I told this story about my personal trials and tribulations of the bankruptcy and, and how I sort of got through it. Um, a few days later, uh, a friend, of, a, a lady who worked for me at Airbus, mm -hmm. had a friend whose daughter was in the audience. I had no idea. But the daughter had sent this note, this email, to her mother who passed it to my friend, who passed it to me. And in, in very simple terms, it said, I've just listened to the most amazing guy. He went through some really down times like I am right now, mum. And he gave me the confidence that I could come through it. Um, I'm not, no, I'm no great savior, but I do believe that being honest about my own personal failings and lessons can, can help other people who may, because you will at times find yourself like this. Sorry, we're getting a bit personal here, Jim. No, that was awesome, thank you very much. Um, so, how did you decide, what got, what got you interested in aviation, and how did you decide it's going to be a career for you? What's going to be? A career for you. Oh, okay. How did you get involved in aviation, and then how did you decide this is going to be my career? So, you have to, you have to imagine, which is tough because most of you weren't born, but you have to imagine growing up in England in the 50s and 60s. It was not long after World War II. In fact, when I was a kid, there was food rationing in England. Um, so we grew up in a, in a relatively austere environment. And, and this is not the famous Monty Python sketch about you know, the Yorkshireman in the pub, um, which is very true. I'd been there, done that. Um, <laughs> but the point was, growing up at the time when the question is relevant, growing up in England, um, it was pretty austere. And I got interested, first of all, in trains and subsequently in airplanes because they represented travel. And travel represented going to see new places and learning new cultures. And in the case of airplanes, doing it in a way where you could get up there and look down here and get a totally different perspective. And, and with, that, with that concept, I thought, hmm, sounds interesting. Went to an air show, a place called Biggin Hill. This was in 1961, uh, just south of London. Um, and they were offering helicopter rides. I uh, had to pay. Um, so I rustled up all my pocket money and bought this 20 minute helicopter ride and I was hooked. Once I got up there looking down and thinking of all the possibilities, I was absolutely hooked. So that, that, I think that answers your question of how did I get into it. Yeah, um, very much. Thank and, you. and ever since then I've had kerosene in the blood, so love it. So how do you, uh, what do you think is the best pipeline for young individuals to get involved in aviation? Ah, oh, now we have a lot of discussion about that. We, we the old grey beards, um, yeah. who feel some kind of responsibility about passing on our tribe. Joining the knowledge. club, right? Yeah, exactly. Join the club. Join the club. Just, um, but what, what's the best pipeline? Well, of course, you're, you're at one of the very best. We are here right now. Um, if, if you're in the aviation industry, uh, Emory Riddle's reputation precedes it. And it's kind of like, well, it's, it's the, it's the go-to place if you, if you want some good graduates, if you want some people who know the industry, if you want people who are about, passionate about the industry, uh, you go to Embry-Riddle. That's where you find it in our, in our club. Um, so 
those of you who are here are clearly already on the right track. Um, the challenge, the challenge I, I think for today is the 50 year thing. 50 years ago, I mentioned no shortage of inspirational programs and people to go to work on. Lots of airplane programs, lots of airplane companies uh, and supply chain. Uh, a, lot, a lot more opportunity to get involved, but most importantly, there was a lot more inspiration. Every time you open the newspaper, here's some guy setting a new speed record. Um, back in those days, the mantra was higher, faster and further. Right. Everybody wanted to... Everyone wanted to do it. Exactly. Um, these days, the industry is a lot more mature. I'll call it mature. Um, it's a lot more of a commodity. Those of you who travel with commercial airlines will realize what we're talking about, right? Um, it's a lot more focused on cost than it is on innovation. Uh, it, it's, a, it's very much consolidated. We've only got two big airplane companies after Boeing takes over Embraer, um, and we've got three, maybe four engine companies, and so on. There's a lot less companies, and there's a lot less programs um, to uh, flags to rally around, if you like. I'm a strong believer in having flags on hills that you have to rally around. Uh, there's a lot less of them, because there's a lot less programs. So the question is, what, what inspires people? Um, what passion can we draw out of them to come into aerospace these days, when everybody wants to go to Silicon Valley and three times as much, and if they don't like the company they're with or they don't like the donuts that morning, then they join the company across the street. <laughs> um, we want people who are going to come into our industry because they want to be here, and they want to contribute to improvement in humankind, um, and they want to have a great time along the way and go home at the end of the day and say, I did that, I achieved that. Um, and I think, I think you have to have that passion. If you don't have that passion, we're probably not going to find a way to bring them in. But if you do have that passion, here, um, North Dakota, yeah. Purdue, yep. uh, any good engineering or aviation school, and it doesn't have to be here, it can be anywhere in the world, get in. And once you're in the club, you'll stay in the club, and the club will welcome you. Yes, absolutely. So I think there, like you said, there might be less programs, and it might be less defined of um, reasons to join the club or enter the aerospace industry. But I still think there's, there's plenty of opportunity, for example, just the challenges of the aerospace industry, such as um, overcoming public trust with urban air mobility or you know, overcoming technologies with hybrid or electric aircraft. So yes, that's the next 50 years. You know, we, we know what's happened in the last 50 years, and I've been privileged to have been involved in a lot of it. In fact, when, when I think about it, the last 50 years actually captures um, almost half of the life of the aerospace industry. So I, guys who have been, like me, who have been around long enough have been very lucky to do that. For the next 50 years, what are those, what are those uh, challenges? What are those innovations? Um, I, I, I sit on a board which Aviation Week, the publication Aviation Week runs. It's, it's the Innovation Advisory Board. And we had a meeting just last week talking about what innovations are coming that we really need the future leaders to be working on. And there's no shortage of them. I mean, no, I, they may not be Concord or Apollo 11, but there's plenty of huge challenges out there. And they're, they're mentally extremely stimulating. Um, we can start off with commercial space, something which you're very familiar with here in Florida, obviously, huge commercial space activities just on the coast here. But all over the country, commercial space is, is a rapidly growing um, and, and technologically very challenging industry to be involved with. Um, unmanned aerial vehicles, gigantic opportunities in UAVs from, you know, as you know, we're already delivering medicines in remote parts of Virginia right. with a drone, um, inspecting roofs after a hurricane. There's so many applications, many of which we haven't even thought of, from unmanned aerial vehicles. But we have to figure out how to build them, and more importantly, how to operate them, and even more importantly, how to operate them safely and under regulatory authority. So on that topic of urban air mobility, so how do you get, you, you know, if you have an aircraft right here, un unmanned, how do you convince the public? How do you convince someone, hey, you know, get in, there's no pilot, but just, just trust me, get in. How, how do you do that? How, how do we do that? Um, so yesterday I'm flying down here, and because the Cessna doesn't work, I'm on Delta Airlines and I'm changing Atlanta. So I get off at Terminal C and I get on, on Terminal D, I have to take a train. Does that train have a driver? No. 
Um, it's full of people. There's hundreds of people on this train, and it's rushing through a tunnel at 40 miles an hour. Nobody gives a damn, right? Right. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking, what's wrong with flying an airplane? Although the reality is, um, first of all, it won't be a pilot. Well, I suppose an unmanned aerial vehicle, a single passenger, could be. But I think the sort of people who are going to take an aerial, aerial Uber taxi mm -hmm. are the sort of people who are technologically pretty savvy. And they're doing this because, A, they have belief in the technology, which is fair enough, because the technology is there. Uh, B, they have belief in the FAA to have certified... Sign off on it. Right. Um, uh, and presume that it's not going to crash into anything or anybody or anything else. Um, so I think the people who are initially going to fly in these vehicles are going to be a very privileged few who are not going to worry about it, at least here in the US. However, even before the US, it will happen in places like Singapore and Dubai and Sao Paulo, lots of other cities, this is going to happen before it happens in the US. So wh why, why is that? Why would they happen outside the United States first? Uh, because, first of all, those, those people are a lot less hidebound by regulatory activity, which you can argue is not necessarily a good or a bad thing. There's a lot less aerial traffic to have to worry about, and there's a lot more need. And I think also the people who are going to do it feel comfortable with using new technology. But then in terms of, I'll call it large volume, flying Delta Airlines without a pilot, um, this is going to take decades. And it will come, first of all, with single pilot. We know how to do single pilot operation today. We know how to do unmanned today, but socially not ready for it. But certainly single pilot will come with, of course, safety pilots on the ground. And secondly, uh, guys like FedEx and UPS are going to be flying packages probably within the next five years without pilots. It won't be 747s or MD-11s. It'll be little Cessna caravans or something thereof. Um, and they'll be flying. So, so this will come in stages. Um, convincing the general traveling public will take probably quite a while. But I believe, um, rather like my microwave, uh, before the invention of microwaves, I thought, why do I need one of them? Uh, one, once I'd actually got a microwave and tried it, I thought, how did I manage without this? Um, I, I think the general public will take to it, but it'll be in stages, in progression, that the industry will introduce this stuff in different phases. So what about commercial space operations? All right, let, let me part that. I'll come back to my sort of shopping list of exciting things to work okay. on, then we'll come back to that. Uh, so we mentioned commercial space, we'll come back to it. We mentioned unmanned vehicles. Um, new forms of energy. Uh, the environmental thing is catching up with us real fast. Uh, I gave a speech at my old alma mater, Loughborough, in, in the UK back in July, uh, and I apologised to the gathered body, the student body, because we really screwed the environment up. We, the last 50 years, we did not do a good job of protecting it, and now you, the future leaders, are going to have to try and fix that. So there's a huge job of work to be done um, learning to respect the environment, and for us that means finding new forms of energy. It doesn't mean um, making it existing engines 10% better. It means hybrid aeroplanes, electric powered aeroplanes, maybe hydrogen aeroplanes. Uh, but new forms of energy uh, will, is a third area for industry really needs to work on very quickly. Um, factory of the future, sometimes called industry 4.0, uh, additive manufacturing, all that goes around the whole supply chain and manufacturing process doesn't just apply to aerospace, but aerospace will be at the leading edge of doing this stuff. Fascinating. And again, really, really huge technological challenges that need quickly solving. And of course, um, going back, not just commercial space, but going back to the moon and Mars, which I'm really pleased to see are now getting a, a new wave of enthusiasm. Um, and I'm very optimistic that those are going to be great programs to work on too. So th that would be my five, you know, big five. Uh, for the future of the industry. But don't forget, um, the vast majority of the money in the business is still coming from the commercial airline business, and we will still need to build better and cheaper commercial airplanes. We mentioned the old mantra was faster, further, or higher. Uh, today it's, let's think about it, cheaper, quicker, um, and more reliable, I guess. So Mr. Eccleston, with that in mind, uh, what, what future 
Because right now in the industry, we're seeing a, a shortage for pilots. We're seeing a shortage for maintenance. What with those? Uh, segments of aviation expanding out, what type of jobs specifically will we see that will need to be filled in the future? Um, clearly pilots, because unless and until the flying public accepts pilotless aeroplanes, we're still going to have this huge need for pilots. You already identified that. Yes, maintenance as well. Uh, that, that problem in terms of sheer volume of numbers is about the same size as the pilot shortage right now. Um, we need engineers, innovators. We already mentioned if, if you're graduating from MIT or Caltech, you're probably going to go to work in Silicon Valley or Seattle or Austin or Boston. You're probably not going to say, I think I want to go for work for Delta Airlines in Atlanta, right? Regrettably. And those guys, by the way, are paying three times as much as an engineer is going to get in Delta Airlines in Atlanta. It's tough. So we, we will need, we the whole industry, and especially Airbus and Boeing, will need engineers. Um, and, and I'm just going to digress on that one because it's important. Um, if you think about it today, uh, neither Airbus nor Boeing has any new commercial airplane program under development. Boeing's talking about doing the NMA, you know, the sort of 7576 replacement. Good, hope they do. Um, but at the moment, there's no new airplane programs. What does this mean to the 40,000 engineers that Airbus and Boeing has right. who are going to retire? and take their pension and go and live on the beach and play golf and they're going to take all that tribal knowledge with them and they do because um, as we learned with the Pratt & Whitney geared turbofan engine the industry learned um, you can't just design these things on computers you need the tribal knowledge that's been built up over the decades by wizened old engineers like I used to be um, to be passed on to the next generation and to do that we need to be doing it pretty damn quick before the, the old farts all retire. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the old people all retire. Um, <laughs> edit that bit out. Uh, but it's a serious point. It's a serious point that the, the hard-earned knowledge of design it, build it, test it, break it, repeat until it works, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, today we have models, we have computer models that take care of all that stuff. Hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work. We need to find some new programs for the engineers to work on to keep the engineering base current when new people come in. Uh, and I'm more concerned about that, personally, than I am about the shortage of pilots. We can solve that with technology in the end. Um, what else do we need? Uh, we probably need a lot of space people. I mean, you could argue it's well, it's aerospace, so what? But astronautics is actually very different than right. flying an aeroplane, especially a commercial aeroplane. So we probably need a lot of space people if we're going to do commercial space and return to Mars and the moon. There's a lot of space people here. Good. That's something I've learned. Good. Please, pleased to hear it. Um, so pretty much across the board, um, we're going to have this, this shortage of people. But the challenge now is we're competing against a whole other bunch of industries who generally are paying more money. Um, and the people who are working in those industries are a lot more mobile and flexible. They don't sort of come and stay for the long-term returns of aerospace. Is that your question? That yes, yeah. Um, and so going on to the point of that, that tribal knowledge, keeping it in the organization, um, you know, that's just one awesome point to have uh, the benefit of internships. Internships and that experience for new students entering the industry uh, to you know, be in-house with those organizations and get that tribal knowledge before they enter the industry. It's a really important point, Jim, and thank you for making that. Um, I know you've done internships. Lucky guy, go to Oshkosh for the summer. Um, I, I was privileged to start my career with an internship. I'm a strong believer in internships, whether it's undergraduate, graduate, or whatever. Um, but if I may, I, I'll, I'll add one supplementary point. Um, I'm also uh, an equally strong believer in mentorships. Um, if you can find yourself a good mentor, I was very fortunate to have four or five at different stages of my career. Um, that can be absolutely invaluable in so many ways. Um, again, passing on the tribal knowledge. I used to say about one of my mentors that uh, he did not teach me everything I knew, but he gave me the chance to learn everything that he knew, and that was really valuable to me. Um, so. Men, I'm, I can't give you the secret source as to how to find a, a mentor. You, you, will, you will come across them and you'll discover them, often your boss. Um, but the really important thing about mentors is 
It has to be somebody that you can look up to and say, I can learn from this guy. He's better than me, I can learn from this guy until I eventually become better than him. Um, mentorships are another really great way to pass tribal knowledge on. So going on to that, what do you think, what do you find impressive for seeing a young professional enter the industry? What kind of skills and characteristics do you find impressive? Um, what I find impressive about the students of today, the, the, the graduates and the undergraduates of today, is the, they're extremely confident. You, you, many people here in the audience, I always admire your confidence. Uh, when I went to university, uh, I was not very confident. And, and in fact, it took me several years working in industry to gain a level of confidence where I believed in myself. You guys today, um, you, all you all believe in yourself, quite rightly. Um, you all have a very high level of confidence. That's one of the things that I, I truly do admire. Um, but I would add to that, uh, don't, don't become overconfident. Uh, as my wife reminds me pretty much every week over the dinner table, don't, Barry, don't believe your own press. Um, and she's absolutely right, because it will catch you out. So try and, try and maintain a humility which, with the confidence. You will find people in our industry like that and respect that. Um, probably the most humble person I have ever met in my whole life, and in certainly my professional life, uh, was a guy called Neil Armstrong. Um, think of what this guy did. It's stunning. And think of what he could have done with what he did, what he could have traded that into. Neil did none of that. Got back from the moon, retired from the program, went back to teaching at Purdue. I mean, how cool is that? That's awesome. So yes, in our industry, we like your confidence, but try and bring a, an element of humility um, and respect for other people's views. Um, one more point I would add, uh, our industry, uh, over the years I've been in it, our industry has become extremely global. By definition, we connect the world together. We're a global business. Uh, we're a global supply chain. When we make our global aeroplanes, uh, an Airbus aeroplane is 40% made in the USA. So is Boeing in, in, in uh, the inverse. Um, so we're a very global industry and becoming more global, especially in the marketplace. So try try to bring with you uh, an understanding of different cultures. Uh, travel is a great educator, um, but as you do that, try and understand a bit more about people's cultures, uh, A, because it's interesting, but B, um, it gives you a better perspective on where other people are coming from. Um, and and I that's one thing I do like about today's graduates. Um, you guys have a lot more global and cultural awareness than I did when, when I graduated, and that's a really good thing. It, it helps you, when you have a conversation, it's really good to understand where the other guy's coming from. To do that, you have to have some understanding of his or her culture. Um, so that's my answer. So Mr. Eccleston, this uh, Career Expo this fall, this is the very first time Airbus is coming. What do you think that means to our students here at Embry-Riddle? Uh, the first and foremost thing, it means Embry-Riddle is clearly on the map. Um, in, in the last few years, Airbus has developed a closer relationship with Embry-Riddle. Um, uh, we heard from President Butler, uh, I, I did earlier on, that there's, there's work going on at the Airbus facility in Mobile, where Embry-Riddle is helping set up an education centre for Airbus. Um, uh, our training facilities down the road in Miami, I'm hoping there can be a closer relationship locally uh, with the training facilities down in Miami. We, we'll, we'll see if that happens. But uh, there's more interface. And of course, the, the guy who took my job, the guy who's now uh, head of North America, is an alumni for Embry-Riddle. So there's clearly a closer relationship. But it's more than that. Um, it really shows that um, the top of the totem pole, that's basically Boeing and Airbus, um, recognizes that if you want good people, this is one of the places you call first to find those people. Um, and for your, the significance for Embry-Riddle is it's, it's a way to get in at the top of the totem pole. People very rarely have an opportunity. Usually, if you're going to come to Airbus or to Boeing, you work your way up through you know, a, a, a metal manufacturer right. or an MRO uh, or an engine guy or an avionics guy, and eventually you, find you, you make the grade and you come up into Airbus. This is a shortcut to get to the top straight away. It's good to hear. So our last question before we move over to an audience Q&A. 
So as you mentioned with the aviation industry being a global industry and the world becoming more connected constantly, 24-7, how do you balance a professional life with a fulfilling personal life? You're asking me? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, <laughs> not, not, not the best. Not the best counselor on that one, Jim. Um, first of all, if you're going to be CEO of a company, recognize and accept it's a 24-7 job. Um, and you better have a spouse and kids that understand mum or dad has a 24-7 job. Uh, this is not a drill. This is, this is serious stuff, running a, a big business. Um, so with that in mind, it's, it's, re it's really tough, and, and especially with cell phones and tablets and everything else, you, you really can't get away from it. Um, what, I, what, I would, from my, what I would say from my own personal experience, the way I rationalized this was uh, I'd go to work in the morning and I have a list of 58 things to do. And uh, so time management was very critical. Everybody in the office knew if we were going to have a conversation, they had to keep it brief and concise and get to the point. Mm -hmm. No time for talking about last night's baseball game, um, which in Washington you don't talk about anyway. Uh, and then at the end of the day, hopefully I've crossed off, let's say, 52 of those things. And I, I would drive home and say to myself, OK, Barry, you've achieved this, 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 and this today. You can now allow yourself to turn off. And on the drive home, throw that switch and become a spouse or a dad um, or someone who father. You know, does the washing up or helps yeah. in the yard or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and try and do that. It's not easy, but, but you know, tr try, and, try and go home at the end of the day saying, OK, I did what I was supposed to do. Um, I've achieved this. The world's a better place because of what I've done today. Now I can turn off and spend the rest of the day with the family. That's what I tried to do. Well, thank you for that. So we'd like to open it up for an audience Q&A. We've got two mics here at the bottom of the stairs. So if anyone would like to come down and ask Mr. Eccleston any question. Oh, I see you planted a question already to get the thing. Well done. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Eccleston. First of all, thanks for being here. Um, my name is Christian Wood. I'm an aviation maintenance student. Um, I wanted to ask you, in the majority of your stories, you brought up having known somebody that worked in, in this company or that company, having known someone that worked in Airbus before you got to Airbus, et cetera. So um, could you touch on the importance of networking and how that uh, facilitated the successful career that you had? Sure. That, that's, that's a terrific question, Christian, and thank you for reminding me to talk about that. Um, Yes, networking in our industry is absolutely invaluable. It's one of your key professional tools. Um, first of all, you have to be able to network, which means you have to have the social skills required to go and network. Uh, you can help develop those here. Uh, lots of opportunities outside teaching to develop social skills and conversational skills and, and therefore networking skills, because that's going to be really valuable. And then when you get in the industry, um, go to industry events. Um, dur during my time involved in the industry, uh, I, I've been the Wings Club in New York, I've been in the uh, Aviation Club of Washington, the Aero Club of Washington, I've been in the National Business Air Aircraft Association, I've been in British American Business Association, uh, about a dozen different things which I have gone out to get involved with, first of all because I felt I could maybe contribute to this stuff, uh, but secondly, it's all part of this networking thing. Uh, and I find it a very pleasurable way of um, advancing, if you like, my career. You know, you get to go to nice events, mm -hmm. nice lunches, and hang out with cool people and meet some interesting people. Um, but most important of all, there's this strong undercurrent, as Christian said, of, uh, as I talked about, people I knew here, there, and so on, all happens because of networking. Really critical point. Thank you, Christian. We'll do this one and then one. So go ahead. Uh, Christian Mueller, Aerospace Engineering. Can you raise the mic a bit so we can? Uh, okay. Christian Mueller, Aerospace Engineering. Um, you mentioned some tough decisions you had to make in Canada and at Honeywell. What were some of the decisions that you didn't handle the best in Canada, and how did that affect your decisions later in Honeywell? Okay. Um, 
So in, in Canada, uh, it was the, the job was more oriented towards managing factories. And as far as Rolls-Royce were concerned, my job was to manage those factories to maximize the profit. Not necessarily to satisfy customers, but maximize the profit. Some of the factories, the performance was not very well, do, not doing very well. Um, and I made a number of critical errors. First of all, um, I had a couple of members of the management team that I put my faith in, and it turned out to have been a mistake. Um, they were part of the problem, if you like, although when I first got there, they convinced me they were going to contribute to the solution, but in fact they were part of the problem. Um, secondly, uh, I learned that if things look like they're going off track, you have to be really, really quick to correct that track. Don't just travel, hopefully, presuming that it will get back on track and, and it, you know, if you keep doing this stuff, then somehow the result's going to change. Rather like flying an aeroplane, you know, if, if I flew down here and made a five degree error um, on the directional gyro, then I wouldn't finish up here, would I? I'd finish up in the ocean somewhere. So it's really important that as soon as you sense there's a, you're off course slightly, make a really quick decision to get back on course, even if that involved making some tough decisions. So I wasn't quick enough at correcting errors when I found them. I traveled hopefully presuming they would get better without any uh, actual control input to fix it. Um, and thirdly, um, it was a very, very competitive marketplace. Uh, it was basically an MRO business and a power generation business. Those businesses are very competitive, much more competitive in terms of margin um, than commercial airplanes or, or military airplanes. Um, so keeping the cost down was really a critical issue. And I allowed those businesses to invest in this, spend money on that, do whatever, when what I sh should have been doing was saying, guys, the margin can't afford that. The market can't afford that. Um, we're going to have to start cutting our costs, not necessarily investing in a new car park, for example. Um, so not, not making quick enough decisions, not making tough cost decisions, and trusting in some people that eventually turned out to be um, the wrong people to trust. Those, those are the three answers without naming names. Hello, Mr. Eccleston. My name is Beckett. I'm a PhD student here, uh, recently graduated. So the question is... Can, can you raise the mic again? I'm sorry. When you get to be as old as me, you don't hear so well. <laughs> Okay. My name is Beckett. I'm a PhD student here at Ember Riddle. Yep. Um, so question is, you said that nowadays all of the uh, plane manufacturers are being like consolidated. We have only two big players, Airbus and Boeing. How does it uh, reflect on the industry in general? Like them absorbing all of the smaller co companies, there is less variety. There is only like two competitors. Let, no, the, I was called, the play field is small. If there are more players, that will somehow change our, like, the industry in general. I mean, I mean so the less number of people, um, players in the market, how does it reflect on the industry in general? Um, so it, it, when we talk about two manufacturers, we're really talking about Airbus and Boeing, so we're really talking there about the commercial airplane business, the, the airline supply business. Uh, if we look at the military business here in the USA, you've got four, maybe, depending on how you classify it. You know, Boeing, Lockheed, uh, GD, Northrop Grumman, possibly Textron. Textron's more in the, in the uh, uh, BizJet business. In the BizJet business, we've got five going on six manufacturers. That is too many. Everybody knows that. There will be consolidation in the BizJet manufacturing business. Uh, in the engine business, we've got three, maybe four. The four, if you count Safran in France, uh, who are becoming quite a big business. Um, and that's probably at least one, if not two, too many in the engine manufacturing business. So I think in the commercial and in the DOD business, um, there's going to be continued consolidation. And that has the impacts we talked about. It reduces the number of programs. It reduces the number of engineers in the business. Um, and of course, some will argue it gives it gives too much power to those manufacturers, Airbus and Boeing. Not 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 just too much power with the customers who are concerned, but the supply chain. The supply chain is terribly concerned that they're just going to have two customers 
Boeing and Airbus. If, you, if you're Rockwell Collins or if you're Honeywell, um, it's a really big issue that there's only two customers who only launch new programs about once every 10 years. It's a really big issue for the whole supply chain. Now, on the other side of the coin, um, if you've noticed, we've just been talking about Europe and North America. What about Asia? What about China? What about India? What about Russia, maybe? All of whom are looking to develop aerospace industries, be it making airplanes or engines or MRO or avionics. Um, not to mention this whole broad swath of new businesses like Uber and Google and Elon Musk and all these guys who are the new um, aerospace entrepreneurs, the, you know, the, the trailblazers in our aerospace business today. So on the one hand, I worry that um, the, guys, the guys who traditionally have guarded the legacy of our, of our industry and still will, um, the guys with all the tribal knowledge, they're sort of being whittled down. On the other hand, there's a regeneration going on, A, with the technology businesses, and B, outside the USA. And so if we view it globally, there's this sort of regeneration going on that we don't always see just here in the US. Hello, hello. my name is Jonathan Stark. I'm a freshman AE major, aeronautic, or aerospace engineering, sorry. Um, my question to you is, being the CEO of such a big company, I'm sure that you meet a lot of uh, teams of people that you've never met, but at the same time are essential to the progress of the business. So what kind of mentality do you come into, or what kind of personality do you want to show these employees, and how do you work with them when you've never met them before but you need to know exactly what they're doing? Um. So, for, for better or for worse, um, I've always been a, a strong believer in people. And especially, as we said, <coughs> the people that we meet in our industry are generally good people, um, and they want to do the right thing. So I always give people the benefit of the doubt, no matter who they are when I first meet them. And it's up to them to prove me wrong, if you like, but other, otherwise they're, they're innocent until proven guilty. Um, and with that belief in people, then I sort of listen to them and I take their advice and, and show my confidence in them and show my respect for them that, hey, you know, I'm, just, I'm new here. You guys have been doing this for the last 15 years. Um, I'm here to listen and learn from you. Uh, and, and for me, that's worked reasonably well. Um, within the first few weeks, you'll realize the guys who are bullshitting you, there are people who do that. We have to admit, we have to rec I have to recognize it, I have to admit it, and, and take action as a result. Uh, but for the most part, I would say probably 75-80% of the people are well-meaning, and they will reward the trust that I will put into them. Um, every now and again, you have to take a prisoner out at dawn and shoot them. <laughs> um, because there, there are people in the organization who are not trustworthy. Fortunately, very, very few, but you'll find out who they are. And when you find somebody whose integrity is not being, their, in, their, in, their level of integrity is not to your expectation, let me put it that way, you take them out and you shoot them. I mean, not literally, obviously, but you, you make a very public spectacle of moving them out of the company. And people will, first of all, people will get the message, but more importantly, you will find that everybody already knew this was a rotten apple, and they're all saying, why doesn't the boss get rid of him anyway? And, and so if you don't do it, then you will lose their respect. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Eccleston. I'm Garrett Fleischman. I'm a senior in unmanned aircraft systems on campus. A lot of the students on campus are not only interested in growing as an individual, but are interested in making a change in our industry. What is your best advice that you can give to students to grow to a high enough rank to have say in order to make that change or make that difference? Earn it. Um, it, it it's, one thing, it's one thing to have a high position. Uh, it's another thing to say from that high position, this is what I want. It's a whole other thing. The secret is to have people um, respect what you, who you are, what you're saying, and actually go and do it. That, that's the secret source. And to do that, um, you have to earn 
that respect. You don't have to earn that high position, you may get given it. You don't have to um, earn the right to dictate what you want to do. It may be your company. But you do have to earn the respect to have everybody else execute and follow your leadership and your position. How do you get to that point? Um, confidence, experience, integrity. See, that's twice I've mentioned that in two minutes now. Can't stress enough uh, how high you have to put and maintain your integrity. Um, you're born with uh, integrity and hopefully you will die with integrity. In between the two, you better make sure you protect it, especially in this business. Uh, so, confidence, experience, integrity, and trust in people. We just talked about the fact sometimes that might catch you out, but generally it works well if you have trust in the other pe in the person you're working with or the team you're working with and, and put trust in them. So that, that's some of the lessons from my personal experience. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amelia King. I'm a freshman in Business Aviation Administration. And my question is, you being a salesman for Rolls-Royce and selling the engines, is um, the industry more of a buyer's market or a seller's market, being from the company selling the engines or a company um, wanting to purchase them? Um, I'm going to give you quite a long answer, because it's a, simp it's a simple question, but there's a number of different facets to it. Um, as an engine guy, you actually have to sell twice. You sell the engine to the guy who makes the airplane, Airbus or Boeing, so that he specs your engine on his aeroplane product. And then when he sells his aeroplane, you go to the airline and you sell them your engine as opposed to the other option, whatever the other option is. Um, airplanes like the A320 come with two engine options. So the engine guy has to sell his engine onto, a, onto the Airbus aeroplane and then he has to sell the airline to buy his engine as opposed to the other guy. Um, so you have to do that twice. Um, what was your question? I've forgotten the question now. <laughs> um, it was, do you think the industry as a whole is more of a, a buyer's, buyer's market, or a seller's market? Um, Maybe, yeah. So if, if we talk about the commercial airline business, which is like 75% of the aerospace business right now, um, it is clearly a, um, it's, it's a seller's market. It's a seller, it has been a seller's market for the last eight years, which is staggering because usually our business is cyclical and the cycle is about every four or five years. We're now in the eighth year of industry growth. Mm -hmm. We only have two suppliers, Boeing and Airbus, which means it's a seller's market. Not to mention the fact you can't buy a Boeing 737 MAX anyway right now. Uh, not to mention the fact that Airbus has sold out of A320s until 2024. You can't get one for the next six years. So it's clearly a seller's market. And if you're an airplane lessor, it's a seller's market for them because they got the only airplanes that you can get your hands on in the next sort of 48 months. Um, so commercial airplane seller's market. Um, defense business. Um, don't know that much about it, but it seems to me right now that there are very, very few US defense programs. Um, like there's one new bomber program and there's one new trainer program. And these things come along every 10 or 15 years. And so from that point of view, that's clearly a buyer's market because you've got four or five potential sellers and you've got one program every 10 years. So that is, in my mind, um, a buyer's market. Uh, in the space business, I don't know because it's, to it's being totally disrupted. T talk about a classic market disruption. You know, the arrival of commercial space is just unbelievable. And I don't know what to make of it, to be honest, except it's really exciting. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Chingwen Kelly Huang, and I'm studying the Master of Aviation Finance. And I've actually just returned from Toulouse with an internship with Airbus, working on the business methodology um, for the propulsion department. Perfect. Um, so my question is, uh, from the management perspective, for organizations as big as Airbus, having um, sites in different regions, UK, Spain, Germany, and America, what does the company do in harmonizing the different business strategies? or processes, and for you personally, do you have any examples of how you translate perhaps uh, what Tom Anders says um, for Airbus Americas, because the working culture is different, 
and the values are different and behaviors, uh, employees' behaviors are different. And how do you make that an easier transition when you manage the exchange? Or how do you translate those decisions um, and follow through it? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, we should have a two-question max rule. Uh, <laughs> however, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some stories as, as I do to try and answer it. Um, first of all, uh, Airbus is a very, very global company. We work in a global industry, but probably more than most, Airbus is a global company. And as seen from here in the US, most people don't realize just how global Airbus is. Um, but it's still headquartered in Europe, and it's still behaves in many ways like a European company exporting, even though Airbus has factories in China, in Alabama, and all over the place. Um, it, still, it still has a lot of European connections and roots, and especially it has some European government shareholding, the French and the Germans. Um, so Airbus, Airbus behaves probably more like a European company, although in fact it truly is a global company, it just don't, don't realize that. So from the point of view of Airbus here in North America, how did we manage that dichotomy? I think that was one of your questions. Um, and the answer is, very carefully, uh, the answer is um, I, would, I would go to Toulouse about every four, six weeks, spend a week in Toulouse, and I would coffee shop around. Coffee shopping is another version of networking, right? Um, I would go and visit each one of the senior managers, the, Tom Enders, the boss, uh, the chief finance guy, the chief marketing guy, the chief program heads of the various programs, the chief supply chain guy. Um, I would set up an hour with those guys, sometimes a lunch or dinner. It's a very French way of doing business um, with good wine. Um, and, and I would spend that hour or lunch or dinner just saying, how can I help you? Uh, of course, they wanted to know what was going on in North America. and. and I had to assure them that we weren't straying too far away from the mothership. We weren't too far off course. But I would usually phrase it more like, how can I help you? What, what could we do in North America to help you? And it was amazing how people would then open up one-on-one. -on -one. They would open up about their professional challenges or Airbus team issues or political issues, um, sometimes some personal issues because I was no threat to them. Uh, I, I was this relatively experienced guy. I'd been around as we talked. I'd had different experiences. Uh, I knew Airbus, I knew the people, I knew how it worked. So I was, if you like, a sort of counselor to some of these people. Um, and, and, and I don't say this to blow my own horn. The point is that um, it sometimes helped if there was sort of like a, an independent referee there to try and pull it together. But through that technique, Here's the point, through that technique, um, I, was all, I was able, not just me, but I, I encouraged everybody else in Airbus North America to do the same thing. <coughs> we were able to stay close to the mothership. They trusted us. They trusted us to get on and do things. Sometimes we did things as a little beta trial, and if it worked, we'd tell them, and if it didn't, then, well, well nothing ever happened, no, 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 no. Um, But generally, we, we'd stay close to the mothership. But more importantly, they trusted us to do what the right thing for them. It, it may not be the answer you're expecting, but that's how it worked for me. Thank you. Maybe one last question. You talked about it earlier a little bit. You surrounded yourself with very capable, talented people. But what is the secret sauce to great leadership? <laughs> Boy, uh, again, you're, you're asking the wrong question, because I have never, ever considered myself a great leader. Um, I've considered that I've been fortunate to have had some positions where uh, I can exert some influence on behalf of the team, but I've, I've always felt the most important thing is that the team do the right thing, and I was just privileged enough to present the results at the end of it. Um, so for me, surround yourself with great people. Surround yourself with people who you can trust and respect and have high integrity. Surround yourself sometimes with people who want your job. That's, some people feel threatened by that. I don't, but I think it's great to have people who want my job and I respect that. Um, 
But the most important thing is find, find the right people, make them into a team, have them work as a team and achieve the results and everybody shares in, in the celebration. That, that's no secret source, that's obvious, but it's the way it worked for me. One more question. One more? Um, I'm a tall guy, so I'm going to stand down here. Um, this must be a really complicated question if you yeah, put No, 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 I'm, just, I'm a terrible speaker, so... <laughs> so sir, oh, you're just checking the football results. <laughs> uh, my name is Daniel Wilczek, I'm a sophomore computer science major, and uh, my question to you is, early on in your speech, in your introduction speech, you talked about project management and um, uh, really like project management skills and that they're very important. So I was wondering if you could talk about what type of skills and how did you pick your team? Because you talked about your team of, of these people and so how did you choose them and how did you manage them? Um, okay, so pro to me, uh, pe people have different definitions in their own mind of what program or project management is. To me, it's the it's the art and the science, because it's a highly developed science, this. there's lots of textbooks written on it. Uh, it's the art and the science of bringing every different discipline together to achieve an on-time, on-cost, on-quality result. Um, so it covers from the initial concept, figuring out what the market wants, to feeding that into conceptual designs, drawing on the TRL levels that are available to make that particular design happen, um, designing, developing, and testing it, all, all, the, all the usual development stuff, putting in place a robust supply chain that can meet the expectations, both of the development program and the subsequent production program. Uh, if you have the opportunity, put a beta test out there, see how it works, particularly with the customers. Sometimes you don't have that luxury. Sometimes you have to proceed directly to production. Um, and your, your customer becomes your development test bed. At that point, you have to have a whole different style, but equally important program management to manage the in-service development. Put it into service, support the hell out of it, make sure the customer's getting all the support he needs when things go wrong, because it will go wrong. If it's an aeroplane, it will go wrong for about the first five years. You'll be really continuing your development program in service. Then put in place a robust customer support organization for the whole life cycle. This is still part of program, develop, program management. A whole life cycle for the next 20, 25, 30 years uh, that the product is going to be in operation. And put a business case around all that. The cost of the initial outlay for the development, the non-recurring cost for the development, the non-recurring cost to set up the production and put it into production, the cash needed to go through the cash trough until you get positive cash flow, um, what's the cash return when, it start, when the cash flow starts coming in, uh, and then how do you put money away to fund the next program and start the whole cycle again. Um, all those skills, in my mind, are part of program management, managing the, the total program from birth to grave, the whole life cycle, uh, and doing it profitably and doing it so that you've got enough funding, intellectual capital and engineering experience to start the next one around and satisfying the customers. How do you find the right people to do all that? Um, trust, experience, integrity, uh, pe people who have done this before, if you like, and people who are willing to go on this journey with you and, 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 and can do it in a team. I, I can't give you any secret source for finding those people. You, you'll know them when you see them. Thank you, sir. Well, I think that was our last question. Mr. Uckelson, it's been a downright pleasure. Jim, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.